Hi there, uh, listener, and welcome to episode 63 of the Ski Podcast. Just remember, quick one, that um, if you if it's your first time listening to the podcast, we've got over 80 episodes now. You can find them all at theskipodcast.com. And remember to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Now, today we're going to be covering a lot of topics. It's been a very, very busy news week. So we've got a lot to cover. We've got vaccines, quarantine, will resorts open? We're going to be talking about Val d'Isere in particular. We're going to have a snow report from Cromontana and Verbier. Talking about ski hire electric vehicles and ski resorts and we're going to be looking at a couple of uh, books in our ski book group uh, corner as well and firstly i'd like to thank switzerland tourism for supporting the show there are 11 ski resorts open in switzerland at the moment that's more than anywhere in the world and we'll come on to uh, that and discuss it in a bit more detail today i'm joined by two guests I've got Vanessa Fisher with me, who's a UK representative for several uh, French destinations. How are you, Vanessa? I'm good. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for asking me to join you. No worries. Well, regular listeners will know that uh, Vanessa's been on the show before. She made her debut a bit like a Dalek in episode seven a long time ago. And uh, then she came back and told us all about her downhill racing experiences in Switzerland in episode 23. So, listener, you can look those up. And then joining us live from Val d'Isere, we have Steve Angus, uh, who is a ski instructor at uh, TDC in in Val d'Isere. How are you, Steve? I'm very good. Very good. Thank you. And uh, hi to all listeners. Well, regular listeners will know Steve because this, I think, is his fourth episode, a fourth appearance on the uh, show. Uh, back in episode six, 25 and 43, normally talking about Val Is that is that right, Steve, or have I missed out any? Uh, my, my memory's fading. I, I thought it was my third <laughs> one, but you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, we're going to be talking about Val Isera as well. But let's start off uh, with the news. Now, I kind of thought we could do this uh, in terms of good news and bad news. So let's start off with uh, with good news. Since our last podcast, we've had um, announcements about vaccines and an announcement about quarantine being cut. It was 14 days. And at last, the uh, Global Travel Task Force have cut it down to uh, to five. That's if you pay for a test. So there have been a few surveys this week. I don't know if either of you have seen these from uh, In Sports Ski Hire and, uh, and Ski Weekend. And they both say that the cut in quarantine would mean that people are more likely to go skiing. Vanessa, what about you? If you only have to quarantine only for five days, does that make you more likely to ski uh, this winter? Yeah, definitely. And I think because we're used to being based at home a lot more, I mean, I work from home anyway, but generally people are much more used to coping at home. I think five days would be doable. Yeah. I did read that you can get a test at a Gatwick airport, I think, for around £60. So that doesn't make it, you know, too much cost in addition to what you'd have to pay for your trip. Yeah, well, actually, that is obviously a factor because uh, the the cost, the government have said between £60 and £120 is what they're uh, anticipating. And they're going to have a registered list of places where you can get them from. So 60 is a significant difference, particularly if you've got a, a family of four that, exactly. you, uh, that you need to, uh, you know, you, you want to get over to the Alps. What about, I know you have a family and you take them skiing. Mm-hmm. In terms of quarantine, there are presumably only certain times in the year where you'd be able to do that, or would you take them out of school to uh, to get them on a ski holiday? Yeah, I mean, right now, that's not an option. I've got one child who's in GCSE year, so she wouldn't want to miss any school. And as they've missed so much school, it's just not a realistic option. Um, so we'd obviously have to look at, you know, where the dates of the holidays fall, but yeah, certainly makes it much more achievable, whereas two weeks totally was not possible. Obviously, <laughs> we're still waiting for results to actually reveal what dates they're going to be open. OK, well, we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> Let's move on to that. What about yeah. yourself, Steve? You're based out in France and your business you know, is de- per- de- dependent on uh, an international market. You know, within France itself, I know it's a very quiet time and there aren't many people around the resort. But the fact that quarantine has been cut, is that created any headlines people talking about that or is that just irrelevant with everything else that's going on yeah i mean it's definitely been very welcomed but i mean within obviously five minutes have been announced as a positive and people started to get a bit more excited (laughs) about it the uh the 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 announcements by uh the uh the french president etc etc sort of sort of over uh, overtook that but there was definitely a 24 hours of 
wow, this is great. We might we might get something out of it. My my slight <laughs> wor- my, my slight worry is that it might lead to bunching up a bit, like Vanessa was saying, in terms of let's say you know you've got two weeks over uh, Christmas, New Year. I know it it won't happen because we're, we're shut for those periods. But if it did, then people might have to come one week and not the next week, and it might actually skew it towards a in an artificial way. Um, certainly, if you're bringing families out, which which would would be interesting to see how that will play out come. After um, and then Easter holidays, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's sure. a good issue. Yeah, well, I mean, it could be interesting. Okay, let's let's move on to that because uh, yeah, there are there is other good news as well. I'm just going to mention again that the resorts in Switzerland are open. There's plenty of question marks as to how long that might happen. I mean, they've been opening at weekends, and we have a couple of snow reports coming up later from uh, from Verbier and Cromontana. But let's move on to <laughs> so much uh, has happened. Let's talk about President Macron and his announcement earlier this week. Uh, you know, I think we were looking at Monday. Representatives of the mountains had had a meeting with uh, uh, Castex, who's the prime minister, and they discussed that they were going to have an announcement within 10 days as to what the situation would be in relation to opening at Christmas. And then the following day, Macron gave his uh, uh um, televised announcement where he said that he saw uh, ski resorts opening as being impossible. I imagine that got people <laughs> uh, talking a bit in France, uh, Steve. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I think he possibly uh, used his words in a way that um, I don't think um, he was necessarily intending to make it as clear cut in how he delivered it. I think I think he was trying to get across the fact that that was his preference and he would be taking guidance and um, uh, going into much more uh, um, analysis of figures and consultation with the with the local um, um, areas of France and, and the, 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 the players, if you like. And I think he came across wrong and he has now been pulled over a barrel, but he's he, he's effectively laid on the plate what he thinks and, and therefore he's now got the rest of his government sort of saying, well, this is what's happening because I've sort of said it wrong, if, if that makes sense. Because I, I, I watched the, the broadcast live, as I know most people will have done, and I got the impression that he, he, he just explained it or maybe the interpreter, I was using France 24 and they have an interpreter translated into English, and I just got the impression that it came across slightly wrong. Yeah, OK, well, that, uh, for, that's interesting to hear you say it that way, because things have moved very quickly since he made that announcement. And uh, I wrote a blog post for Skipedia yesterday talking about how the resorts have responded. And I see that there's a, firstly a petition out there at the moment that now has, when I, when I looked at it earlier today, over 35,000 uh, signatories, because it's been pointed out that there are over 120,000 jobs uh, that are affected directly or indirectly by uh, or through the ski industry in France. And that up until, you know, very recently, the uh, French Minister for Employment had been saying to resorts, oh, yeah, you should employ your uh, temporary staff for this winter, your seasonal staff. Uh, so the resorts have been going ahead and preparing. And I think they feel the rug was pulled away uh, from underneath them. And we've seen uh, an open letter to uh, to. I can't remember if it was to Castex or to Macron. Uh, and we've seen the president of the, the Savoir uh, making a statement. And the one that I really like the best, uh, you know, a lot of social media coverage, but uh, from La Clusa uh, yeah. saying, saying uh, you know, we're not a theme park. We're not an amusement park. You can't just close us and open us when we want to. And I've seen this hashtag around saying, je suis une station, I think it is. You know, yeah. We're, yeah. We're, we're, we're not uh, this kind of shopping centre where you can decide whether people come. People live here all year round. Like you, you live in Val d'Isere, Steve, all year round, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the results were surprised, even though there was sort of rumours that the restaurants wouldn't open until the 20th of January. I think they had hoped that they would be able to run some lifts, rightly or wrongly, whether they'd got, you know, their hopes too high or something. But as you say, with the decision to get the staff employed and some of the resorts, I can't remember which ones now, but they were saying we would only take two days to get up and running. That's all they need, you know, two days notice. I was talking to the uh, representative, uh, the STVI, the sort of local lift 
pod the other day and I was asking him how it might work in terms of unemployment benefits and whether, let's say, the resort could open, whether they would just open a few lifts, whether it would be financially worth their while. And it turns out that the staff that they've got on the books for the winter, they they have to pay them a certain amount anyway. Um, and therefore, they would effectively, even if there was only one person coming to the resort, they would open some lifts so that people could ski, so they could physically turn over some money to cover those costs because they're like the furloughs in the UK there would always be a cost of having these people on the books so there was always going to be the, the lifts were going to open even if mm -hmm. you know, only a few locals were prepared to come here they were always going to try and do something and therefore there would always be a potential to turn over some money in terms of the resort right that is interesting because that's something that cropped up mm -hmm. uh, in our last podcast when we were talking about the, the financial viability of actually mm -hmm. opening lifts so the current situation as of today, which is uh, Friday the 27th of November, is that, as I understand it, the resorts are open as such, but the lifts are not. So if someone you know, is, is allowed to travel uh, within the area, depending on um, the distance that they can travel, are allowed to go to a resort like Val d'Isere and they can go for a walk, uh, for example, but they can't go skiing. Is that right, Steve? Yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, 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 it's bizarre. I mean, it, 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 it'll be, I mean, the, the season doesn't officially start here till tomorrow morning, but um, it's going to be very bizarre to walk around town when all the workmen that are here at the moment finishing off the, the building trade that happens when there's officially no ski season. And when they've all gone at midnight tonight, and then there's no tourists here tomorrow, when literally there will just be shops open and the only people walking about will just be the same locals and nobody else. It's going to be even more eerie than it was in lockdown the first time. Yeah. And can I ask you, what about ski touring then? Because, you know, I understand you obviously, you obviously, we talk about ski touring a lot on this podcast. You don't need lifts to go ski touring, but there is the potential burden on the health service if someone, you know, had an accident. Is ski touring formally banned? <sighs> I don't think I don't think I don't think they've actually made an announcement on it. Um, I, I I don't think it will be banned. Um, I don't think it will be I banned. I had an email this morning from Layman Weir to say they will open on the fifteenth of December and ski touring and cross country skiing will be allowed. Yeah, yeah. No, okay, well that is it, very it, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's an it's a, it's a, it's a potential individual exercise in the same way that. As of tomorrow morning, we can now go for three hours and up to 20 kilometers for our exercise. Um, and whether that's on by foot or by, um, by, by bicycle or whatever it might be, there is technically no difference whether you're doing that on a pair of skis, I mean, than doing it on the road. Um, so they can't really stop it, I don't think, at the moment. Yeah, well, think. that will be really interesting because you're saying I, I understand that um, within um, France currently or as of tomorrow, um, the, it's going to change so you can travel, at, as you said, three hours and, and 20 kilometres. But um, shortly after that, I think it's mid-December, then that is going to there's no going to be no 20 uh, kilometre ban and you can travel outside your areas. So uh, people will go much further, be able to go much further. Yeah, they will. That, that, that they will. I mean, I'm slightly perplexed, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if he, it does get skewed a little bit, because there are certain. Unfortunately, it happens to be the Rhone Alps region, so the Savoie, the Haute Savoie, the areas that are highest case numbers. I wouldn't be surprised if, if that um, that secondary opening on the fifteenth of December gets changed somewhat to areas such as ourselves, which are now higher. Uh, instance rate of, of cases and things like that but no. okay okay well that's very interesting so we're obviously focusing on france there because the next issue that's been going on this week is the question of whether we're going to see a pan-european uh, oh, yeah. uh, ban let's say on ski resorts opening and it started off with the italian prime minister i think it was saying that he didn't want italian ski resorts to open to which they responded by pointing out the economic uh, benefits uh, and the importance of that uh, and we've seen responses from, um, I think, the Austrian finance minister who says, well, that's not a problem. We don't mind closing, have an EU wide closing of our ski resorts as long as we're financially compensated the two billion euros uh, that it will cost us. So, Vanessa, what's your what's your feel for this? Well, are other countries going to stay open? 
I've got friends who have got businesses in Wengen, for example, and obviously right now there is Swiss skiing, not in Wengen because it's not open yet, but they hope to open. And, you know, my friend who runs a ski shop there, the ski set, he says, you know, why should they have to close just because France and Italy are closing? On the other hand, I can understand that, you know, the Italians are saying, well, people are just going to travel, aren't they? If one country is open and another country is closed, then the Europeans are just going to go to wherever is open. And surely that's just going to cause chaos, overcrowding, raising levels of the virus. So I can, you know, I can see it from both sides. I don't, I don't know what the solution is. Um, Steve, do you have any have any thoughts on that? Do you think it's going to make any difference? You know, do you think that these other countries, Switzerland, Austria, Italy, will close as well? I don't think so. Simply for the reason that things change day by day, week by week in, in, in this coronavirus situation, and it is still in November. And dare I say it, rightly or wrongly, people aren't really thinking properly about skiing certainly this year of all years until the day before they want to go and put skis on their feet therefore i think most people and most governments are going to be not really seeing this as an issue for a few more weeks yet i'm not saying that's the right way of approaching it but i don't think they're really going to look into it in much depth until it suddenly gets through the christmas holidays and suddenly people are in, you know going to go skiing or not that's a really interesting take on it. And it is hard sometimes, you know, because I've been like yourself, probably because the ski ski industry is our life uh, looking ahead a lot. And I'm looking at the fact that there are not many holidays being sold. And it was really interesting this week uh, to see the traffic going up on the different websites that are, and companies that I look after after that quarantine cut announcement. And then suddenly being in a situation where, you know, the, the majority of British people who do travel, who do ski, do go to France, being placed in a situation where maybe they're not going to be able to travel. And when will they be, when will that uh, change? Uh, I mean, from a holiday maker's point of view, obviously it's different for Steve because you live in the resort. But if you're in this country and you want to book a holiday, if Switzerland is open, then surely that's a great opportunity for people to book a holiday. So from oh, the end, absolutely it's much better, isn't it? If we've got, I don't know, Switzerland's open, Sweden's open, that gives, you know, the British market some opportunities to travel. And that's is much more positive. Whereas if the whole of Europe shuts down, I think that's really difficult for our industry in the UK. Uh, I'm completely uh, with you on that. You know, I'm more into positivity and I'm interested in the general sentiment. And the general sentiment, it will be much more positive if it's possible to go skiing at all. Yeah. However, we should, we, you know, we've moved on to the bad news. We should probably mention, sadly, that um, another company has bitten the dust since uh, our last uh, podcast, which is VIP Ski. It were quite a large company. They were taking 10,000 people a year, according to their website. Uh, and they have a predominantly a chalet company and they have gone out of business and hotel plan have announced they're not doing any chalet holidays this winter and Balkan uh, holidays, certainly not doing any December or January holidays. Um, Jim went out to Bansko. Uh, you can listen to his podcast uh, or his review of Bansko back in uh, 48 and 50 episodes. I think, Steve, they took a lot of people out to Val uh, You know, will, it, will that have an impact on Val do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the IP are, are certainly in terms of the numbers of tourists that come here, a, a huge player there that they, they really are. Um, I have a lot of contact with them um, in terms of the work I do. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it ha- it'll have a, a big impact for sure. I mean, just on that point about putting staff out, um, most most people I've spoken to, um, uh, I know the owners of, of, of Val their only tour operator here, and they, they're quite a big operation, and they made the decision just to bring out literally two members of staff just to be in a position so they can effectively try and outsource any, if we were going to open or not going to open, outsource any things like cleaning, l- using ad hoc local labour and try to strip out any talk of offering catering or anything like that at all so that if the decision would be made to you know open the resort then they could have said right we'll use such and such local person to do the cleaning at probably an inflated rate but at least we can offer the holiday to people that booked it without taking the hit on having members of staff ready to go 
Yeah, well, I mean, that's, uh, that's another issue as well, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, we talk about negativity. It has slipped uh, by. A lot of people have noticed that Brexit is, is coming up on the 31st of December. And it is extremely complicated. It always has uh, in terms of staffing uh, in the Alps. But my understanding is that uh, you, if you're an employer... As long as you had your staff in the Alps prior to the 31st of December, then it wasn't going to be an issue for the rest of the season. But with resorts in some cases not being open till the 31st of December, we're finding that more and more tour operators uh, uh, have already cancelled their programme. But how are they going to get round that particular uh, issue? I spoke to one tour operator who told me that uh, they, they just think the local authorities might they have so much going on they're not going to be able to uh, to deal with that. But um, really you're probably can't. better placed for that, uh, Steve. Any any thoughts on the, the staffing issue for the rest of the season? Well, I mean, as, as you said it, really, I mean, all I would say out here is there's a huge amount of solidarity between, I mean, I know that there's probably slightly different from a lot of places because there are a lot of expats out here, but there's a lot of solidarity of people sort of, you know, jumping in together and sort of saying, well, you know, if you need somebody in, you know, to, to clear snow outside your chalet, if we ever get open, then I'll do it. And I normally, I'm a ski instructor and I'll do this and that. And everybody's just trying to muck in and potentially be on standby to help out, really. I mean, it's quite a, yeah. it's a bit weird. Well, it is, it is a very <laughs> unusual season, that's for sure. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question on the whole of the, uh, the will the season happen? And that is, Vanessa, I'll ask you first. Yeah. Will the season happen and from when will it happen as far as uh, you know British people are concerned let's say Oh well I'm I'm hopeful yes we'll get up and running by the end of January and we'll have February March and April Wow <laughs> That seems like a that seems like a long way away. I'm busy. I'm busy hoping that uh, Switzerland is going to keep going, and I could go there in December if there's any snow. Steve, what's your sense? Will the season happen, and from when? Yeah, I it, it'll it, it, it'll definitely happen. Um, as far as from the British Olympic point of view, I, I would agree with what Vanessa says. Really, I think that there will be more French people coming earlier in January because I think the pressure will be so great that Macron will have to allow resorts open let's say the second first week of January whatever it might be but from a British point of view later in January I think yeah well I think they have said that if that rate goes below 5,000 I think it is new infections per seven days or something like that uh, and it's currently 20,000 then that's a position to review but let's keep let's keep a, a positive there is skiing on we we have mentioned it and uh, we have a couple of uh, snow reports uh, from uh, Cro Montana and and also from Verbier. So uh, let's just have a, a listen to them. Hello, my name's Sam Goodless. I work for Altitude Ski School here in Verbier, and it's a pleasure to bring a report on some of the snow conditions, but also some of the new COVID regulations and guidelines we've been experiencing in the early parts of the 2020-2021 season. We've mainly been skiing during the weekends only uh, at around 2,200 metres here in Verbier in an area called Lac de Vaux. Now, Lac de Vaux hosts a couple of really nice gentle blue runs, a red run and also a black run. This weekend, so on the 28th of November, uh, we've actually seen a new area open up which goes from Attila around Lac de Vaux, but all the way back down to Runette. So any of those larger weekend crowds have started to be dispersed, which is fantastic. It gives people a little bit more room to enjoy uh, the mountain. Obviously, on the south facing aspects, so from Attila down to Ruinet, uh, it's been more man-made snow. But in Lac de Vaux, just because of the north facing aspect, a lot of the natural snow that fell earlier um, has actually managed to stay quite good as well. Some of the bigger changes we're noticing here in Verbier, some of the COVID regulations, which I must admit has been fantastic to see that people are abided, abiding by this. It mean, makes for a safer season and a prolonged season as well. It's been really good that the general etiquette around the resort 
um, I was quite surprised to see some people in, in place, um, up people of authority, reminding people to wear things like masks um, and just keep people's distance. Also, there hasn't been the same rush to get onto the chairlifts um, as, as I normally see this early in the season when people are keen to get back on the skis. There's been just that general, that extra consensus that people need to play it a little bit safer and make sure everybody individually feels comfortable when coming into the resort. I believe that if Verbier can do this, then uh, other resorts should be able to follow suit and it sets a really good precedent for other resorts to uh, make them feel com confident that not only can they open, but they can stay open for the 2020-2021 season. We're really looking forward to some new snowfall that's due during this week. However, they've decided not to open it just because of the lack of snow. How, uh, from the 5th of no, uh, December, though, we will be opening up the full resort uh, for more skiing um, and throughout the whole week as well. So we're really looking forward to that. If anybody would like to come for a ski, come and join us at Altitude Ski School. We'd love to show you around the areas that are open either next weekend or after that throughout the week thank you very much for having us on the podcast i hope that helps and stay safe keep skiing thank you very much thanks to sam for that report from uh, verbier let's go to uh, pierre Henri, who's over in cromontana in switzerland hi to all winter sports fans in england listening to this podcast I know that many of you out there are eager to hurdle down the snowy slopes of our mountains. I'm Pierre Menetti, Sales and Market Manager in Cromontana in Switzerland, and I am happy to give you some news about our beautiful ski resort in the heart of Valais Alps. We can't wait to see the first big snowfall of the season. I need to feel this good sensation too, in the fresh and powdery snow of the early season. At the moment, snow is falling, but at high altitude. In Cromontana, we have already opened uh, on weekends the glacier piece at 3000 meters altitude. The traffic is very good. Here too, people are keen to ski, which is very encouraging for the season. It is obvious this season will be different from others. The COVID measures must be applied and respected. This is serious matter for us here in Crown Montana and our dearest wish is that you, our visitors, I mean you guys, feel confident during their stay. The principles of distancing, disinfection and protection are put into practice everywhere in the ski lift and also in the mountain restaurants. We recommend that skiers wear a mask approved by the Swiss Sanitary Services. It is available everywhere. This protection is very comfortable and also has the advantage of protecting against the cold. I believe that skiers will adapt very quickly and uh, it won't even feel think about it after a few runs. Of course, you can also use the hospital mask that you find in UK too. But the one with, uh, we offer here is much more comfortable and very nice. You know, I also think that this winter will allow many people to experience the mountains differently. After lockdown, we associate the mountains with a feeling of freedom, of being able to live out one's desire intensely. Perhaps we will have a greater desire to experience new things in the great outdoors. And the mountains have a lot of open spaces. To discover them, there is nothing like ski touring or snowshoeing. It's great to go to places where almost nobody went before you. The snow crunches under your footsteps, we hear the sounds of nature, and we can take the time to admire the landscape, which it's more difficult to do when you're skiing, concentrating on where you're going and on your skis. And here in Cromontana, with 18 peaks above 4,000 meters in a clear panorama, uh, 100 degrees in front of you, including Matterhorn and Mont Blanc, this is something you really need to take time to admire. For me, the mountains are great ways to recharge your batteries. And in some ways, it is the best stress therapy. Well, it does for me anyway. 
My final words today for this podcast is, come on, guys, book your ski holidays. You deserve it. And it can only do you good. And if you can choose Kramotana for this one, you make me so happy. And I can assure you, you won't regret it. So, until I see you here in Kramotana, take care and don't miss out. Please, don't miss out on your winter holidays. Bye. Bye from Kramontana. So there is skiing in uh, Switzerland uh, at the moment. Uh, Steve is in Val d'Isère. Let's have a little chat about Val d'Isère. Before we came on air in the green room, you mentioned to me that uh, yesterday uh, the latest news had changed in relation to the World Cup races that are coming up. Do you want to tell us what's going on there, Steve? Yeah, so the they're being frantically trying to make the snow to try and make the... The, the, the first week, if you like, of World Cup races, which the men's technical event take place. Um, normally, that'll be on the fast, but this year they've moved it to make it biosecure um, to the slopes down to Ladai. And yesterday they had to make the decision that, unfortunately, due to continued seasonally uh, warm temperatures, unseasonally warm temperatures, sorry, they pulled the plug on that race. Um, it's gone to a place in Italy, I believe. Right, OK. OK. And and you are, I believe, you have a view of that uh, piece. You're looking out to La Fasse just uh, now. I can see you looking to your left uh, out the window. Um, is there any Ladai, snow in resort? Ladai. Are you in Ladai? Is there any snow? No, there, there is no natural snow skiable um, below about 2,500, 2,600 metres. The, the only snow lower than that, realistically, is, is artificial snow for the most part. Right. OK. And, you know, this would have been the official opening weekend this weekend. So realistically, the resort wouldn't have opened or it would have opened just on the Pet Clay Glacier or something. No, it's not the Pet Clay Glacier, the Pizai Glacier. <laughs> yeah, you think about our trend there. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, yes, exactly that. Yeah, we, we, we'd have been up on the Val de Glacier, the Pizai Glacier only, I think. Right. OK. And what about in resort itself? Is there anything, you know, when we do open, whenever that is, towards the end of January, et cetera, what, what if anyone's going out to Val d'Isere this winter, are there any new lifts or uh, any new developments in town that people can look forward to? Um, not, to be perfectly honest, not a huge number um, in terms of changes. I, I have noticed they seem to have put, and I don't know any details about it, a new lift down in Tina Brevia, which is obviously part of the the Espaskili yeah. ski area, um, but new lifts in Val d'Isère, no. The, the most exciting development, um, I think, by the looks of things, is over the road here, um, near the bottom of the, um, uh, near the bottom of the funicular, they've finished building this new apartment block there, and it looks like it's have an amazingly large uh, drinking balcony decking area for people to have an apre beer in, so. <laughs> that, and not tell me, <laughs> well, do you really think that's going to happen? Because one yeah. of the things that Val is true. most, yeah, What's one that? of the things that Val is most famous for is is the folly deuce. And I've already read uh, elsewhere that the folly deuce are going to completely scale back uh, their apre. I think they're still going to have their cabaret, but there will be no dancing on the tables. Now that will be interesting to see how they, you know, enforce yeah. that. Yeah, and and the same with. Uh, the same with the Coca Rico um, in in the centre of town. The same there. They've they've said table service only. They're going to totally uh, strip it back and 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 reinvent it because you, you've got. I mean, it's not just the ski industry. You've got to you've got to offer something to to, to keep the cash to, the cash tools turning over. So it's better than nothing. For sure. I mean, I think it is interesting. I know we've discussed already. Uh, you know, should the ski resorts open? But it, and in France, which I'm much better informed about, although you know it's the same you know across all of the countries, there have been a lot of steps taken to make sure that uh, the lifts are cleaned on a regular basis. You know, everyone has to wear uh, masks. There's social distancing. You know, where uh, it can be done in resort, it looked like you know restaurants wouldn't be opening. Even in uh, hotels themselves, people would have room service, etc. Uh, there's a trend towards, you know, self self catering apartments and people kind of living within their own bubbles uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, and apres ski, as you mentioned, Vanessa, has just been scaled back across the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, no wonder Austria say, oh well, we should be allowed to open because, you know, a resort like Ischgl has gone from being apres ski centre and that's how they sold themselves to a resort where they're saying, oh, you know, we're not going to do any apres ski here. <laughs> you can forget about it. Any thoughts on that, Vanessa? 
Well, I was just thinking about um, your very first sentence about results were ready. You know, they'd been running in the summer, going back to that La Cluza, um piece about we're not an amusement park. You know, they're a, a year round village with farming communities. Everything was in place. You know, they were used to running the lifts safely, socially distanced. People were used to wearing masks. It just seems a shame when they were, you know, they put their preparations in place. And I think as, you know, as a British holiday maker, for example, going to a resort, we were also in the mindset of, OK, maybe as your family unit, you can travel on that lift. Um, I think the apres ski thing is kind of sensible, a bit like they've been doing in pubs in the UK. Sit at your table, have your food to your table. And we'd have just had to get on with that this season. And I guess once they do open... That's how it will be. I mean, that when you know, I talked to you before about the Inferno in Switzerland, and they've already said that their sort of legendary parties after the race won't happen. So that's uh, similar to the Folly Deuce. You know, they've they've said if they can go ahead with the race, they'll do that, but they won't run the big parties. But yeah. I think people were okay with that if they could actually get some skiing in. Yeah, yeah, you know, well, yeah. well for sure. I, I think that uh, people would uh, be be happy to sacrifice a bit of apre for uh, yeah. skiing. And for me, it probably wouldn't make any. As we said before, it probably wouldn't make any difference anyway because I'm not often uh, in the, in the bars uh, after skiing. I don't have any energy left. Some, you know, a company like Newco that do all the student travel. It's really tough for them because it's, you know, that's a huge market, and to results like. Teen and Val d'Azer and Val Turin that get all those early season bookings from the student groups. Yeah, you know, the yeah. apres ski is a huge part of what they do. And that part of the industry is just, it's devastating for them. For sure. Well, you know, people, evidently people are going to go skiing at some point. We'll, we'll, we'll find out uh, when that is in, in due course. Um, yeah. I just I just wanted to um, kind of move on to uh, mention Intersport uh, Ski Hire because they're very... Uh, uh, well, I'm delighted to say that Intersport Ski Hire have decided to support us on the podcast, and it means I'm going to be able to say some nice things about them. But it won't be anything that I uh, I don't mean because uh, I've used Intersport quite a few times uh, before. Now, I think the main thing that it, it, listener, if you're thinking about your holiday and going out to the Alps, it doesn't mean that you don't have to book Ski Hire now because they have a uh, guaranteed money back uh, cancellation. Cancel your booking up to the last minute and get all your money back using the Refund Now button. With Intersport's new option, you're in control. And uh, they also did a survey this week, which I found quite interesting. Now, I don't actually own skis uh, myself. I always uh, hire. But they asked people why they hire if they do. And uh, 81% of their customers do it so they don't have to lug their, their skis around. Uh, I wondered, uh, Vanessa, I guess that you're probably someone who owns your own skis. Am I right? Yeah, I do. But I don't always take them, interestingly. It depends on the trip, the trip length, you know, a bit like that survey. If, well, if I'm going for a longer amount of time, it's easier then to rent them in resort. If I'm just going for two or three days, that's often when I'll take my own because then I can just, you know, get there. I know I'm all set to go and I don't have to spend half an hour, 40 minutes in a ski shop in the morning sorting out what I'm doing. And also if I'm going for a longer amount of time, often I take the kids and they don't have their own kit. So then if I'm going to a ski rental shop with them, well, I can pick up a set of skis for myself at the same time. And also with them you're carrying more kit anyway it's just me going for a weekend you know with a friend or with with my husband then it's no bother for me to take them out yeah i, I mean I, I kind of prefer uh hiring because normally i'm traveling by train and it is a lot easier if you're not uh, taking skis uh, with you although like i said i haven't actually hired any for a long time but their survey also said that 33 percent hire specifically because it's actually cheaper than paying the ski carriage uh, on flights as well, which is something I haven't done for a long time, but um, I can't remember how much that is. 
Well, listener, I can tell you that I just had a quick look, and for EasyJet, for example, it's £37 each way for ski equipment, which is quite expensive, certainly uh, more expensive than ski hire in many resorts. So if you'd like to save an extra 10% on uh, in-sport ski hire, then use the code WINTER2020 at the checkout. So that's WINTER2020, and you'll be supporting the ski podcast. Now, I'm just going to move on now to uh, electric vehicles in ski resorts. So I don't know if uh, the two of you had the chance to listen to this, but uh, I was able to. It was really, really very interesting uh, kind of panel, effectively, where I chatted with uh, some other people within the industry who own electric cars or are using them in ski resorts. Firstly, I asked Rob Forbes from Cool Bus how he goes about charging his fleet of Tesla X's that he uses for transfers between ski resorts and the local airports. Uh, Rob, can I ask you a question then? I mean, you're based in uh, Borg. How do you, you know, you've got several vehicles to charge there. How do you go about charging those? Because clearly making sure that you have adequate range at the start of a transfer is essential. Yeah, well, we do. We charge overnight at our base. Um, That can be a bit of a headache because you can't have all three cars charging at once because there's, there's just not enough power coming into the house to, to cope with that. Um, but right. let's, yeah. as you know, with Teslas, you can program them to charge at, at certain times. So we have to be very w- well planned with how we're going to charge the cars through the night. Um, we also use, there's a supercharging station, a place called Arshomp, which is just near the border as you go into Geneva Airport. About ten minute drive from the border. We use that. We use that for every whilst on every single Geneva airport transfer, basically. Uh, right. There's also a supercharging station near Moutier, a newer one near a hotel in La Lachaise, Les Bains. Uh, sorry, sorry, you said in in Moutier itself. Just before you get to Moutier, yeah, it's like um, one of the last towns near a place called Aigues Blanche, uh, just yeah. on the right before you get to Moutier. So it's not on the not on the motorway as you're coming uh, out, just off the motorway. Yeah, you just right. it's just two kilometres off the motorway. Yeah, and Great. what sort of charger is that? That's a Tesla supercharging station. So is it okay? That's a good one. Um, you can actually use the spa facilities in the hotel for half price whilst you're charging your car. So that can be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so like, go and have a quick hot tub while you <laughs> while your car is charging. In this second segment, I talk to Richard Sinclair from snow.co.uk about longer journeys uh, in a Tesla and how you recharge along the way. For sure. I think that one of the advantages of a Tesla and another reason that we uh, went for it uh, is the benefit of the superchargers when you are on a longer journey. And, you know, I've been up to visit my uh, dad a couple of times, and that's basically the longest journey that I've done. And it's quite frankly incredible when you stop at uh, one of the superchargers, how quickly they can replenish uh, the, the tank, so to speak. Definitely. I mean, when we when we drove down to um, Cannes and Saint-Tropez, we basically didn't really stop to charge. We just stopped to eat. So whenever it was time to have, we'd get up and maybe smash out an hour and a half and then have breakfast. And um, and then you'd have the kind of full charge for the rest of the morning to drive until lunch sort of thing. And then same sort of thing in the afternoon until tea time. And then, you know, because we were trying to do it all in one go, you know, we, we didn't do a the kind of casual stop halfway down. We drove pretty much all the way. Um, and uh, and funnily enough, actually, with the autopilot, that made it really easy because you kind of sat there chatting. And I mean, you could you shouldn't, but you could virtually sit there playing cards facing the other way on the motorways. It's fairly nailed on. Um, and um, and so it makes getting down there in one massive slog. It doesn't feel like a slog at all. You arrive pretty fresh and, and because you're not freaking out about the charge. I mean, the, you know, the French road networks, I mean, you guys living out there you i mean you don't know how lucky you are it's, it's like a fresh laid <laughs> driveway a french motorway compared to the british pothole roads it really is uh so you know it, it's, I mean, it's lovely it's like driving on carpet you get to get out there and um and because you you know you you type into the sat nav where you're going and it just tells you where the stops are and you just make them match where you fancy eating lunch and breakfast and tea and what have you uh so it's, it's pretty it's pretty stress-free actually yeah for sure i've i've kind of overruled uh my tesla because as you say you put in the destination i'll tell you where you uh where it thinks you should charge but a couple of times i've kind of overruled it because i think well i don't necessarily feel like i want to stop there i'd rather stop at a service station where the kids can roll out and go and get yeah. whatever they uh whatever they need you actually have richard on on your website 
this uh, excellent page uh, all about uh, driving an electric vehicle to the Alps. Do you, do you update that on a on a regular basis? Because you mentioned how things have changed since yeah, uh, fairly. the last few years. Yeah, fairly. We we also we try to tie into, I mean, if people want to drive electric down there as well, it, we, I think the idea of that is just trying to make it a little bit easier. So there's also a, a great big list of all the hotels that have got um you know, uh, destination charges and EV charges out in the back car park and that sort of thing, you know, because actually some people now will choose what hotel they stay in according to can they plug their car in. So yeah. um, that's that's definitely uh, important information. Um, but I think also, you know, having, having, I suppose, more detailed information and experience, it's quite nice to try and make it easier for people, who, you know, to not have to go into, you know, half a day's research in order to be able to do it. You know, it's, it's all sort of on one page. For sure. I mean, I was going to be driving out to Outdoors in April, another holiday that was uh, cancelled, and I had planned out my route around uh, hotels that had chargers, et cetera, and it seemed to be pretty straightforward. I never got the opportunity to uh, try it, but hopefully I will when we repeat that trip uh, in in April uh, itself. Um, Al, can I... I, think, I... Also, just Sorry. really quickly, I think also it ties in really well with the, um, the sort of... Um, the resorts that are trying to uh, get to sort of net zero as well. You know, I think um, there are lots of resorts now who are making the effort to make their infrastructure uh, essentially carbon neutral. And um, and it's kind of, I think it sort of behooves us all to support that effort by going to those places um, in preference to other places. You know, it's um, uh, it, part, part of, I think part of, um, I guess, greening the way we live is actually about putting our own spend into places that are doing the same thing um, rather than just tacking our own greenness on the side of maybe something less sustainable. Yeah. Have you ever seen an electric vehicle out in Val d'Isere, Steve? Yeah, yeah, well, loads of them. Uh, there's quite a, lot, quite a lot of people that do have uh, electric vehicles out here. Um, in fact, um, a couple of hotels partner with Tesla out here and they have uh, weeks of the season where they let people test Tesla's galore and, and they're all over the place. Um, so yeah, there's quite a few around. There are lots of charging points around the resort now as well. Yeah, well, that was one of the things that cropped up, the uh, the additional number of charging points that are, that are cropping up. Vanessa, I spoke to John Tregell as part of that, uh, talking about his Twizy. I think you know uh, him. Have you ever seen yeah. a Twizy? Do you know what type of vehicle that is? Is that one of those, yeah, the, the very small electric cars, aren't they? That... It is a very small electric car. Yeah. And he has customised it by putting a, a ski rack on the roof that he constructed himself. And JC yeah. runs up from Saint-Gervais, where he lives, to Contamine or Combleu or Megev. Uh, you know, it uses a bit of battery on the way up, but on the way down, it's downhill and it has regenerative uh, braking. So uh, you know, that works for him really well uh, over there. Well, I was just going to say there's a new hotel that I've done some work with, um, La Monset in San Nicolas above Saint Gervais, and they have got the funkiest garage under the hotel. Like it's been painted by local artists. And I thought it was really key that, you know, they've got all these electric charging points underground. Okay. So that's, you know, for resorts, that's going to be something else for them to consider, isn't it, with their developments, where they're going to put the charging points and. Absolutely. One of the points that was made by uh, Richard uh, from Snow.co.uk was that resorts and tour operators, there's a big incentive uh, for them to get charging points in place, because if you do want to be green and you want to be yeah. environmentally conscious, then you should be choosing those resorts who are making the most effort. And a lot of resorts are trying very hard to uh, to get the uh, flock, uh, flock en verre. Yeah, uh, yeah, the flock on their uh, label. Uh, but equally, you know, I was saying if you're a tour operator, then install a charging point you know, by your uh, chalets if you've uh, got them, because that's a really great selling point that you can uh, use. And uh, it'll become more advantageous as it goes on uh, as well, particularly after the announcements that have been made uh, just recently by the UK government about ownership. And I think Macron has a kind of green um plan as well where they're investing a lot into the uh, the charging network um yeah and if you're driving out um which you know everyone says that driving is going to become more sort of well could be more popular this winter with people being a bit more nervous potentially about flying you know if people a lot more people have that either hybrid cars or e-cars and so like you say you you need to know that when you get to a destination you're going to be able to charge up yeah okay uh, steve yep yeah. 
Well, I was going to say here about us there, we've got a new mayor that got elected this year and he he's, uh, he's very focused on the green agenda and his master vision is that people, whether you come by coach or by car or whatever it might be, you will arrive in, if you know Val is there, the, the first part you come to is Ladai and, and there'll be like a reception sort of centre with multi-tiered underground parking there where you park your car, um, plug it in, and then there'll be like, a bit like in Zermatt, electric vehicles whip, whipping you all over the resort. So it will be a, um, a very, very green resort where you effectively stop at the front door, leave your car there, and then the rest of it is electric vehicles so that the, the, the town is kept as clean and environmentally um, pristine as possible. Right, that's really interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, you we're can talking put... about a 20-year plan here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You can put an electric uh, car onto your uh, Christmas list, listener. Um, <laughs> something else on my Christmas list, I'm going to drop this into the uh, show notes, is a um, a 3D printed snowblower, which is electric as well, I believe, for, you know, remote controlled uh, snowblower. I, I shared this video. Did uh, Did you get to see this video at all, Vanessa? I just opened the link and saw the snowblower sitting <laughs> like on the side of the mountain, was it, or something? But I didn't actually open it. Well, you can you can use it to uh, uh, to clear your drive if you yeah. if you want to. You don't even have to go out there on the cold days. Steve, do you think this is something that you'd want to put on your Christmas list? <laughs> yeah, along with the rest of the rubbish I've got in my flat. <laughs> no. There's a few um, other things I need more than that item. I think at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it could be useful. Also, on my well, it's not on my Christmas list anymore because I got myself um, a pair of sunnies from Messy Weekend, which you know, to be honest with you, I haven't really had the chance to try them uh, yet because it's not been very sunny and I haven't been able to go uh, uh, skiing. I do have goggles from them. Do either of you two know that brand, Messy Weekend? No, I haven't yeah, heard of it. Yeah, I've, I've heard of them. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, well, have a look in the show notes and you'll see a link to them and you'll be able to look a bit further. Let's move on to Ski Book Group. Um, we I, earlier this week actually released a ski podcast special where we were talking about Aiming High, the uh, the life of Erna Lowe. Regular listeners to the show will know that I interviewed Mark Freire uh, earlier last year I think it was and actually put together all of those interviews and an interview with Joanna Yellowleaf Bound uh, who is a former CEO of Ernalo and worked with Miss Ernalo and that podcast is all about her Miss Ernalo who is extremely influential in the ski industry you know debatably was a person who started uh, chalet holidays but certainly was operating from the 1930s uh, i know vanessa you know uh, earn low as well but you contacted me about um the book that we covered uh, last week a whole life uh, which you read as well i did i love that book i love the sort of gentle nature of it the kind of journey of the you know main character through his life from you know a sort of troubled boy up to a wise elderly man and all the developments in the Austrian village yeah I thought it was a really I was I was thrilled to hear you review it because I loved it excellent well I'm delighted to hear that and um you know it is a brilliant book and I really uh, enjoyed reading it and recommending it you mentioned to me a book that you're reading um maybe at the moment or maybe you've just finished and I believe it's called Beneath the Scarlet Sky do you want to tell us what that is yeah, so, um, you know, I saw your review. And as you say, I started this book, didn't really know much about it. I think it was recommended through a sort of Amazon Reads link or something. And um, but the first section, I haven't finished it yet. I'm not not far off, but um, relates the tale of a, a guy, Pino, who um, he's a, a real, you know, real. It's a, a true story, but slightly fictionalized. And he's sent from Milan during World War II up to Madesimo, the ski resort. Oh, yeah. I've been and, there. Yeah. Well, I actually haven't been there, but it's a place I'd really love to go. And um, there's a huge section that describes the mountains and the Grappera mountain. And basically, this character, Pino, is involved in um, rescuing Jewish people who are, you know, escaping the Nazis. And they go up to Madesimo. And they stay in a refuge and he is involved in taking them across the Grappera down huh. to the Swiss, the, the Swiss side, basically. Right. And, um, you know, it is incredible because that is, you know, the factual part is that he did save 
you know, 50 to 100 um, people who would have died. And then, it, you know, it's switched now into much more about the war itself. And um, he becomes a driver for one of Hitler's main um, sort of, uh, you know, Nazi leaders in Italy. And But it's really fascinating about he's a driver and he drives up to the Brenner Pass and discusses how um, they're trying to clear the snow through the pass so that the um, Germans can retreat back up, you know, into northern Italy. And Pino is actually a, a spy, and so he's telling the Allies just bomb, bomb the snow so that the snow falls down on the roads so that they don't have anywhere to escape to. And it, it's just great because it's based on fact, but it's you know a lot about mountains and an adventure. And I mean, and, and do you find yourself you know in the mountain environment, which mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why a whole life is great. So I think I'll look out for that one. I just looked it up. It's called Beneath the Scarlet Sky, and it's by a guy called Mark T. Sullivan. Uh, yeah, and it's really taken 10 years to research and to write it. Um, so really, yeah, really interesting. OK, cool. Well, uh, that, that will go on the list uh, as well. Um, I just wanted to read out a, a couple of reviews that we had in. One from someone called uh, Dodgers via Twitter. So it's a Twitter uh, uh, handle. Uh, nice to listen to people talk about skiing and managing to stay positive about the up and coming season. Hopefully uh, you still think that after this episode <laughs> as well. Um, Sally Ingham contacted us and said, I love the ski podcast and uh, listen to you often when I'm working at home. We've got Mark Wilson via Facebook. He says, I listen to the podcast everywhere, especially in the garden with my headphones on while I'm messing about. My skis are ready to go. Uh, Chris Howie said, it's excellent to see you continuing your great po podcast, even with uh, COVID coming down. Keep up the good work. Now, a point that Chris made about train travel and interestingly we just touched uh, on it we had a train travel special which you can find uh, on the website and the difficulty of traveling traveling with skis uh, which you mentioned uh, as well Vanessa and I think next time we look at uh, train travel we'll uh, address that as well uh, he also um, suggested taking the sleep train up to Scotland well I can tell you Chris I am working on that um, as long as Nicola Sturgeon lets me I'm hoping to do that in January and to go ski touring in Scotland. So we'll see uh, if that happens. So um, otherwise, if you missed our Facebook Live about uh, electric vehicles, that will come out as a ski podcast special uh, on the 8th of December, um, a week after this one. Uh, and I'm also working on a possible Q&A with Ed Lee. So watch your space uh, for that. And otherwise, um, our next episode 64 will be in a couple of uh, weeks time. And uh, who knows what will have happened in the world of skiing between uh, now and then. So, um, listener, remember to subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. And please do uh, tell your friends about us. You can follow us at the uh, Ski Podcast on Twitter and Facebook. And you can follow me uh, on Twitter at Skipedia. I'd like to thank you, Steve, uh, out in Val d'Azere. And, uh, and Vanessa for joining us uh, today. It's been a difficult few weeks, but hopefully we can look forward to uh, some skiing this winter at some point. So uh, thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, listener, we will, you'll be able to hear us in another couple of weeks' time. Thank you. Bye.